I have the honor of introducing our next session, which is going to be um, Kai is going to be talking to us about the management of the long lived server. So he'll be given his session and we'll try to leave some time at the end for a Q&A. If you have any questions throughout, feel free to use the Q&A option or drop it in the chat and we'll communicate those to Kai at the end of the session. Okay. Yeah, so welcome to my talk, Management of Long-Lived Servers, the Missing Bits for Avoiding Conflict Rift with Declarative Configuration and Image-Based Updates. Long title. I'm Kai Lücke, one of the Flatcar Container Linux maintainers, and I work at Microsoft. The agenda will be um, yeah, to do a quick recap about the reasons to use a container OS and principles like immutable infrastructure. Then we look at the pain points and formulate this problem statement for declarative reconfiguration. I will talk about existing solutions to tame the OS state and some upcoming new developments and ideas. If time permits, I'll end with a demo of a new Flatcar feature for, for declarative reconfiguration. So for infrastructure management, I see three principles that relate with each other. Immutable infrastructure has a goal to avoid conflict drift by not managing servers, but fully redeploying them for changes. Examples are Terraform, given that you only use SSH actions at provisioning time and not afterwards. Another example is Ignition to configure the instance on first boot and Ignition only runs on first boot. And you can also build a custom image, of course, with all configuration in it and then deploy that. With caveats, Ansible can also be used for immutable infra if you don't use it for, to reconfigure the instance. And with cloud in it, we can also do immutable infra if here as well, we, you don't use it for reconfiguration. Infra as code has reproducibility as a goal. And thus, instead of manual actions, you only use automation, ideally uh, version controlled with Git. Examples are Terraform or Ansible for automation or kubectl apply to deploy containers um, from a Git folder or a GitOps pipeline. Declarative configuration has the goal to describe the target state that should be reached and ensure it is reached. So we can contrast this to using scripts that perform actions to reach the state. So this fine difference to have a description of the target state enables us to compare the wanted configuration with the current real state. Now examples are Ignition, Terraform, Cloud init, Ansible, or with the constraint that reconfiguration of the server is not recommended. Uh, because old state could be kept and not be cleaned up, which creates conflict drift that is not captured anymore in the declarative configuration. So I invite you to think about how these principles relate with each other. For example, can you do immutable infra without declarative configuration? And we can ask, isn't immutable infra just a mean to get declarative reproducible and reliable behavior? And can we also do proper declarative configuration without strictly immutable infra? And we'll get to that. I would summarize the goals of these principles as follows. A common theme is reproducibility or reliable operations. We easily want to get to the declared target state. For example, apply and divert infra changes in version control. I think a nice property to have for that is introspection. While this is needed for decorative configuration, it also has a merit on its own for debugging or security when doing attestation. Speaking of security, we want to stay secure, which I here equate with having automatic updates to be on the latest version. Finally, the principles all aim at low maintenance, to have automated deployments and be able to roll out updates. A nice property for that, I would say, is to have low coupling of the parts, which facilitates easy updates without being blocked by dependencies. And for frequent updates, it also uh, yeah, helps to have health text and automatic rollback after breaking updates. So after this high-level talk, here's an example of managing a container to show some of these principles in action. The focus here is on the image reference, not the container startup config or how to handle persistent data. The first observation is uh, with container images that we do immutable infrast when we recreate the container and not, for example, update it from the inside. And we also do declarative configuration for the container image because we specify an image hash or a tag. And when we do that, we can also see what it means for reproducibility. An image hash is stronger than a tag. But still, in both cases, we can have the ability for introspection. We either compare the two hashes directly, or in case of tags, even with a bump tag, we can see um, what hash was used in the end by looking at the stored container image at the host. 
So this hash versus tag topic also lets us think of two ways to do automatic updates. You can bump the tag server side, for example, caddy2 would mean to get the latest 2.x.y released, or you can update the hash or tag in the configuration for client side control. So do we want more reproducibility or more convenience and low maintenance with bump tags, or for example, for reproducibility, except to have some git churn in the repo for image hash updates. You might know these pick two triangles, but I see this as a triangle where we can do compromises as wanted, but actually you don't have to, you can pick all three. For example, for low maintenance and reproducibility and automatic updates, what you do instead of bumping the tag manually is you automate the hash update through some action for your Git repository. And to keep it low maintenance when having automatic updates, we should have uh, health checks in place for auto rollback. So coming from these considerations, we can um, look at the container OS as an OS optimized for modern infra principles. Maybe container OS is a misnomer that doesn't convey this enough. Um, image based OS is a better term, but still doesn't cover all aspects. The OS has an immutable hermetic slash USR OS partition. It's self-contained, meaning that uh, it has all that is needed to boot and it will create missing files on the root FS. And since the uh, deployed software is not part of slash USR, but lives outside normally in containers, but could also be static binaries, there's a low coupling between the OS and its container runtime version and any software then deployed on it like containers. The read-only slash USR image also um, or partition also gives us reproducibility because you either use version X or Y compared to the traditional way of having a varying set of packages and old package state. We also have introspection because we can check the OS version or the hash of the slash USR partition and enforce integrity with the DM verity hash for security or reliability. Such a modern OS normally also has inbuilt first boot provisioning tooling with decorative uh, configuration. And uh, we need that because like a container to serve our purposes, the OS may need some additional configuration and data outside of slash USR. And the OS usually also has automatic updates with rollback on a failed health check. And the essence here is that an image-based OS with in-place updates of the slash USR partition sidesteps this requirement for a full redeployment to follow immutable infra and still get a decorative, reproducible, and reliable behavior. So remember, you can already do immutable infra with custom-baked images, and you don't need a container OS for that, but here we can actually update the OS, and then the end result will be like a clean redeployment. But we look at how this promise is kept and to what extent. Well, let's see closer how we can declaratively control the OS version with an image-based OS and in-place updates. So we roll out a specific version. This version comes from release that happens on a cadence, providing both the full image for fresh deployment and the update palette for in-place updates. The rollout is either client-side or update server-side, so similar to the case with the container image registry where the tag is bumped. For example, Flatcar asks the Nebraska update server what version this machine should be on. The benefit of this model is to have a global rollout policies, for example. And for purely client-side control, Flatcar also has the Flatcar update tool to switch to a specific version. You can automate both scenarios with, for example, GitOps. So either the Git configuration controls what version Nebraska announces to the client instances, or the Git configuration controls the parameter for Flatcar update directly. So all is good. From my experience, I would say not yet. Here are some pain points. Um, we still need a full redeployment for user configuration changes. This takes long, local data gets lost, a new cloud instance may mean to get a new IP address, the SSH host keys also change. In practice, one can reach a common escape hatch for ignition users, which is running Ansible for reconfiguration, but reconfiguration that way does not work reliably when the decorative configuration can't clean up the side effects. So the result is that the old server state creates some config drift. And the quick reaction to this problem is to try to rerun Ignition after changing the configuration, but rerunning Ignition is tricky and needs cleanups of the root FS, or you end up with config drift here too. And in Flatcar, you can tell Ignition to reformat the root FS, and I had demoed this in last talks, but still that means we would leave, uh, lose local data. So my problem statement is to have reliable decorative reconfiguration. I want long-lived servers, no 10, 20 minutes reprovisioning for a single line change. And we can divide the problem by having, uh, yeah, by defining the server state to have uh, 
kind of four parts, I would say. The OS version, the configuration, the data, and other state. So what do we need to do with each part? The OS version in slash USR, as it can be controlled client side or server side, we already updated in place, so all is good there. Um, the config files under slash DC from previous user configuration. So assuming that OS allows the user config to live under slash DC. Um, so what do we do there on configuration changes we have to discard it. OS config files under slash DC, these come from legacy software that doesn't support reading them from slash USR. When the OS uh, slash USR partition updates from X to Y, this should also be updated, of course. And uh, then there's local app or user data that can be somewhere on the root FS, yeah, depending on where this is allowed by the OS. And that, of course, needs to be kept when we reconfigure. And there's wanted OS state to keep. Um, so that's like data, um, for example, secrets or ETC, SSA, shows keys. These are also nice to keep, of course. And the old user configuration also resulted in unwanted state from side effects. So we need to discard it without actually knowing what it is. We already can see this challenge um, that all this data is combined in the root FS, for example, under slash DC. So to address this problem, new OSs were designed with approach to minimize and define the OS state. And the idea is to disallow traditional Linux usage with this pattern of writing things directly to slash etc or similar. Instead, it's defined what local state is allowed and how it's managed. You can see this example um, in single purpose container or Kubernetes OSs, Talos, Linux, or Amazon Bottle Rocket, which has a read only root affairs plus ephemer ephemeral or specific persistent storage partitions. And this principle enables Talos Linux to have a reset tool that makes use of the separation, but even on regular Talos Linux updates, Talos will already discard the OS state, uh, so Kubernetes state as well. And um, yeah, that's the default behavior you can opt out, but uh, yeah, normally it means the node will join as a fresh node afterwards. And this is in progress our project. It also kind of depends on how you would use it. But the idea is again that uh, you don't have the user state um, leak into the OS and all setup would be, go through some OS API. So these are interesting approaches, but not everybody can go this route. Actually, even traditional Linux already manages slash etc to some extent, and we should discuss this a bit closer. Both user and OS config files are under slash etc and need to be managed. Let's first look at how, um, yeah, at these OS config files. So modern software like systemd actually is fine because it uh, first looks under slash USR and supports all these nice drop-in overrides and so on. And uh, yeah, you can also have a look at the revised XTG based specif base tier specification on the URP group website. But legacy software still needs full config files in a slash DC and, and does not support all these drop in um, stuff for config extension or override. So, traditional package managers solved this uh, updating of OS config files in slash DC already. They identify user changes and update unmodified OS config files only. And we need to bridge this logic to the image based OS world. So again, this is just about OS config updates, not yet about user config changes. And um, so what are the image-based container OS distros doing for OS config files? Um, the old core OS container Linux approach was to use symlinks under slash DC to slash USR or downstream patches to directly look up configuration under slash USR. It also used system temp files, but if you um, use them only for creation, it means they get outdated afterwards and always enfor enforcing the um, creation Recreation would be uh, yeah, overwriting any user modifications, so also not a good solution. But Fedora Core does is a three-way merge of old and new OS tree state and the user changes for ETC. So that sounds complicated, but it's actually file-based, not content-based, and the user change files always win. New and flat car container Linux is slash DCS overlay mount with OS default files from slash USR slash share slash flat car. Uh, this is also file-based and user change files we win. With both approaches, you can introspect the user changes. With Flatcar, you would run git diff as shown here. Um, yeah, so that kind of concludes the part about OS config updates, but left us a quest to reliably do user config changes with a traditional Linux. 
So there are some new upstream developments that fit, in, fit well into this problem space, actually for both user and OS config updates. The systemd project develops system extension images with systemd sysx. Systemd sysx allows to extend slash usr or slash opt through overlay mounts. The sysx image can be a single file system image for atomic updates. It's verifiable for integrity and provides easy introspections through version metadata or calculating the image file hash. And soon there will be system configuration images and short sys CFG images for extending slash etc with um, user configs in a single image file, then yeah, stacked as overlay mount. This gives in place config updates. But we could also use it for the OS configuration as done in Flatcar with this ETC overlay. Once um, yeah, so CFG would have this uh, overlay mode as well. So currently in plan, in progress, only the read-only mode. So again, what does it give us in the end? Um, we can almost reliably reconfigure, but still not 100% because we cover taking out all config files, but we don't cover discarding the side effects. You can see this as opt-in versus opt-out discarding. So yeah, we still would need to know what to clean up in addition. That's complex and means that, that we have conflict drift unless we say that the rest of the root FS is read-only or ephemeral. So my idea was to do a selective OS reset where we remove the OS files by default, except for some paths to keep. I had presented this idea in the last talk with a proof of concept patch for ignition, but now, um, came to the following solution. So the opt-out of the cleanup of old state is done by letting the user define what data to keep on reconfiguration events. There's a new feature in Flatcar, the Flatcar reset tool stages an OS reset on the next boot and the init run FS has boot logic to perform the selective cleanup. The user can specify regular expressions for paths to keep. Example is uh, war lib container D, we have your container images there or ETC uh, SSH host keys or yeah, var log. And the tool will also prepare ignition to rerun optionally from a different config source other than the initial cloud user data. Plus there's a setup of the machine ID as a kernel command line parameter to preserve it, but because we must delete slash ETC slash machine ID or it won't have the system be first boot semantics. So I think this was the last missing B, uh, piece for um, long-lived servers. And with that, we can reliably reconfigure a server instead of having to fully redeploy. And I re prepared a demo for this new Flatcar feature where I'm using Terraform. The ignition config is stored in the cloud instance user data and updated in place. This triggers then Flatcar reset with uh, keeping some paths to preserve. In this example, this is SSH host keys and certain a certain uh, app data folder. It uses ter a Terraform action here, but it could also be done in a service on the server itself. The difference here is the question of when and how to specify the path to keep before the configuration change immediately or before the next configuration change. So yeah, for Terraform, I also needed a workaround to skip this um, helper action on the first run because it would otherwise directly reset uh, after provisioning causing a delay. And then I also found out that I needed another workaround for Azure user data um, to avoid serving outdated user data by waiting for the change to propagate. In this demo here, uh, yeah, there's a state file coming from a certain configuration setting and we expect that to be discarded and we'll be observing that the state file gets removed and newly set up based on the new configuration value. Okay, I have to reshare. And it looks like we're running a little short on time. So maybe we should share the demo in the chat for folks to watch after in case they have any questions that they'd like to ask you directly, Kai. Okay, but yeah, I try to be quick with the demo. Okay. I have to press twice. <laughs> okay. I will also share the YouTube link.
Yeah, to save time in this demo, uh, the server is already provisioned with Terraform apply and it runs the following ignition configuration, which um, yeah, has this test service and the test service creates, uh, um, has a setting value and it creates two files the same way if they don't exist. It's one is a side effect file based on the setting value and another one is the data based on the random value. So for reliable reconfiguration, when we change this uh, setting, we expect that this config uh, side effect file should be cleaned up and then uh, yeah, should be able to be recreated while um, this my data folder should be kept. And we will also preserve uh, some SSH host keys and uh, the system logs as well. And that's in uh, Terraform variable here. So we have these um, reg regex for the host keys and then also the simple pass for my data and log. And each time Terraform sees a user data change where we touch this file um, above with the ignition configuration, it will run the following helper. Um, that's locally. So again, that's uh, yeah, more workaround than I expected. And so the first uh, thing here is waiting for the Azure metadata to pick up the change. And then uh, yeah, we run flat car reset. Um, and there I also have this reprovision marker for Terraform to yeah, not do it on the first boot. But this really is the core logic, flat car reset, keep machine ID, keep pass as um, specified by this keep pass Terraform variable and then do the reboot and uh, yeah. So that's what you would also be able to run directly with SSH. So here this helper is also able to run either via SSH or AZ extension stuff. So let's prepare a configuration change that triggers the reprovisioning. Um, we have the setting V1 and now we can change it to be V2. And now we can run Terraform apply. But uh, first, let's see what the current values are so that uh, it's kind of yeah, more clear what's happening. So current value is this V1 setting, what we expect to see. And uh, my data is 20931. Now we run Terraform apply and I will skip forward. OK, Terraform apply ran. It rebooted this instance. Um, and in the init RD, this uh, selective cleanup is done now. And yeah, it should have kept this slash my data folder. And then ignition runs again to set up all these uh, yeah test uh, service scripts and so on. And um, yeah, we will also see that the new value um, should be picked up for the state file, while for the data we expect the old value to be there. It can be checked via SSH and yeah, so that's it. So we see V2 was picked up, but we still have the old data. Okay, yeah, so that's it. Uh, I will share the slides again. And Kai, we do have a question in the chat. Um, from yeah. Colin, wondering if there's any reason not to use slash USR slash ETC instead of slash USR slash sh share slash flat car. Yeah, many people used uh, slash USR slash ETC for different things now already. And uh, yeah, in OS3, it was more like what we also uh, do, but now other people. Um, use it more as a way for reading default configuration um, by the application directly. So in our overlay, that's not what we want. We want that uh, to be just a lower deal for the um, slash etc overlay and not directly read by applications. Thank you. And with that, we're just about at time. Uh, Kai will be here for a couple more minutes. If you have questions yeah, to drop in the chat, he can respond to them quickly. Um, but for other folks, we have another session right after this. 
the um, VFK uh, minimal hypervisor using Apple's virtualization framework. So if you don't have any more questions, go ahead and move over to the next session. If you have any quick questions, Kai can respond right in the chat uh, before you head over to our next session. Thanks for joining us. Hi, if folks are still in here, we do have one question in the QA. Um, Paul Meyer is asking, "What's the?" Uh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh huh. What's the advantage of Netcar over Fedora Core and OS? Yeah, so uh, Flatcar is having an AB partition scheme and it's not using OS three, and yeah, it's kind of the embarrassment means you can, uh, yeah directly see if there are any local modifications, for example, because of disk failures or uh, yeah, tampering with the disk, and then uh, uh, DM Verity will uh, stop execution. So that's one difference, but there are also a bit yeah, other difference, but mostly it's, uh, it's yeah, similar, of course, because there's the same roots for self-ignition, afterburn, and so on. So this Flatcar reset stuff is all uh, new in Flatcar and Flatcar specific, and yeah, I think you can't do that with uh, Fedora Core S. Awesome, thank you. We have just a couple minutes left. We do have um, a participant, Colin. He asked a question here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and let him in. Colin, if it ends at 10:30, we do apologize in advance. Um, the session cuts out, but let's go ahead and get you in here to ask your question really quick. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's it's great. I, I love this direction. You know, I was, yeah, so I work on Fedora Core OS and derivatives and, uh, you know, we kind of both came from that original container Linux parent and have kind of gone in some different directions, but I'd love to, you know, align and, um, you know, figure out shared common approaches, um, especially if we can provide interfaces that work across both um, for our users. That seems really good. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, I recently started a big um, project around this to really reframe everything we're doing in Fedora Core OS on a container native flow. Um, long story short, on this topic, basically, um, I even started some code, but basically Bootsy will allow attaching config maps to the OS state. Um, and I thought a lot about problems like, you know, how do you do static IP addresses with this? Um, you know. But I think there's some common problem domains in here. Like certainly, you know, in the upstream system D projects, they have nothing to do with container images. Um, so th there's a sort of front end and back end problem. But you know, maybe if you just get a chance, we could chat on that issue. But um, or if you have any immediate replies here, I'm curious what you think. Uh, yeah, how, how would it look to use config maps as a source for OS state? What do you think about that? Yeah, I haven't looked into that yet. Uh, yeah, so I, I knew about Bootsy, but not about this config map topic. Um, so yeah, it would be yeah, something I need to read up how it kind of relates to uh, yeah, live configuration and so on. Okay, yeah. All right, and our session's about to then close. Go ahead and head over to your up, next right? session.